Hey everybody, it's Bailey Wiki, and I've got a really interesting and cool session today. And I'm actually joined by a few friends of mine. Uh, we're going to be looking at the new Crucible game system that came from the Foundry team. And we've got one of the architects of that system here, Atropos himself, Andrew. Andrew? Hello, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, really excited to get a chance to show and talk a little bit more about what, uh, <laughs> what we've been creating. Yeah, well, when I saw this, I was totally intrigued, but I very purposefully didn't jump into it because I, I wanted to ask you to walk me through it. Um, it always Good. better to get it from the horse's mouth. Um, and I'm actually joined today by two friends of mine and, and team members on the Bailey Wiki team. We've got Zephyr. Hey, Zephyr. And also Joby, who y'all might recognize from the familiars and has done some really cool stuff with us recently. Hey, Joby. What's up? All right, so we're all dms and gms and so i think we're all interested uh in we, you know we i think we all have interest across you know multiple game systems so i think we're super interested in this game system because it's uh sitting at the center of our favorite vtt right so we've all yeah. built uh so much stuff around what i would consider the best vtt on the market which is foundry and now we've got this game system it seems like it's purpose built uh, in inside of it and and presumably leverages um, all the best stuff that Foundry does. So don't disappoint me, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's exactly right. That is definitely the the premise and the vision. Uh, Crucible is a new and innovative, or so I claim, uh, role playing system built exclusively for Foundry VTT. It's as a digital platform. So it's. Uh, it's designed from the ground up to, you know, leverage everything that Foundry can do and to provide GMs and players with a really powerful tool set that, um, you know, facilitates role play, but also, you know, strategic combat and uh, interesting character development choices and compelling social or exploration systems eventually, hashtag. Um, and so uh, it's a system that's that's very new. It is in, I guess, what I'd describe as sort of like alpha testing um, this is the first playtest of the system that's available now. Uh, currently, the first playtest is available to our Patreon supporters because I've been promising for a long, long time that that would be a Patreon perk that people would get, and I, as of yet, had not uh, followed through on that. But um, happy to have all of our, our Patreons who are checking that out at this time. And the playtest uh, covers basically an introduction to the system, an introduction to character building, an introdu introduction to the gameplay mechanics and dice mechanics and all of that. And, you know, as you can see on uh, Bailey Wiki's screen, like if you install the system, you have an adventure for like playtest one that you can import that has all the stuff that, you know, you can check out that gives you a sort of a contrived arena style, you know, combat premise where you can create some characters and advance them and fight against some different, um, you know, some different challenges and tr test out the mechanics of the system that way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's designed specifically for Foundry VTT. So we're not, you know, we're intentionally not doing a print book, uh, which, you know, I'm sure some people would love that. But the fact that we're intentionally not doing a print book means that we can intentionally do some things that would never work in a print book. Um, and so some of the things that we're doing with character development, some of the things that we're doing with combat automation, um, you know, there's a little bit of crunch to the system, but it's crunch that I, I think is really elegantly handled behind the scenes so that as the game master and the player, you don't have to really grapple with all of that during play. You just get the satisfaction of having these really like engaging uh, choices that you can make. So really trying to provide characters with a ton of choice that they can... Um, you know, have both in terms of how to advance their character, but also like, what do I do on my turn? And making those sorts of choices and then consequences of those choices really impactful and engaging and satisfying. And so that's kind of what Crucible is all about. Um, and yeah, love it. Well, I, I'm seeing JB2A and Sequencer. I know those are, are, are core, core components of it, right? As far as modules that support the system, so, is that right? Right. So there's a couple of there's a couple of modules that we've like done a little bit of extra work to integrate with to provide mm -hmm. sort of a seamless out of the box experience. At the moment, it's not a long list, but uh, with Dice So Nice, there's some like custom integration with the dice mechanics that have a little bit of like a custom effect. 
um, depending on certain things that you roll. And then there's a custom built-in integration with Sequencer and JB2A so that your abilities that you use have like built-in animations. Now, that's possible in other systems, you know, with some modules that provide that kind of translation. Uh, we just built that directly into the system. And, you know, it's not about like trying to take over things that modules do, but we just want Crucible to be something that like you can install and you get this really rich experience more or less right out of the box. Of course, you know, we'll integrate with modules when there's opportunities to, to do that um, as well, yeah. Well, I was really excited. These are two of my favorite modules and to, to see them as part of the, the, the plan was super exciting for, for me and I know others. Okay, well, I'm looking at this world that you, that you created and you've invited uh, the, the four of us all together into the world. Um, what, can you kind of orientate me around, um, you know, what, what I should be kind of paying attention to? I was kind of clicking around here. I think you saw it. Sure, well, why don't I, why don't I tell you, direct you first to like the rules content of Great. the system. So if you go to the compendium sidebar and then under the crucible folder, there's system rules. There's a bunch of different compendium packs as you might expect with any game system. But um, the system rules is kind of what you would normally have in your in your book. And so if you start under getting started and then maybe, well, DICE is interesting as well, but it, maybe under getting started, if Got you it. look at kind of like welcome to Crucible, um, this would be sort of like what you'd see at the you know front of the book. And it kind of guides you through the process of learning about like what's, you know, what's the system all about? What's available in Playtest 1? There's a bunch of things that are highlighted as like under construction to like let people know like what we're actively working on. This is very much under active development. So there's significant portions of the system that aren't entirely built yet. Um, or aren't at all built yet, but we're trying to like let people know, you know, what we're striving to do and what the objectives are and where we're going, um, so that folks can both like have fun testing it now and provide feedback, but do that in a way that's aware and cognizant of like what's the direction that we are taking with it. Um, you know, under like you're looking at system cornerstones, a couple of those that I would really highlight. Um, character progression, as I mentioned, is really uh, you know central to the ethos of the system strategic combat like really giving people crunchy and interesting choices to make in combat rather than just okay i run up okay i attack end of turn okay i attack end of turn okay i attack end of turn um you know really trying to give people uh, a lot of options a lot of things that are exciting and effective and heroic and satisfying to do and, and to really like feel like you just love playing your character um and uh, consistently automated mechanics so a bad reputation in the community of being like an anti-automation person or something i don't know um i i like automation i'm thinking I, to back back to our last one yeah. shot right where you were just you just wanted to do everything manually they you know, forced automation <laughs> on you i just I, I i love automation when it's elegant and when it feels like it fits and i think that sometimes like automation for a mechanic that isn't fundamentally designed to be automated it just feels a little bit forced to me yeah and so like for me the the difference and i don't want to be like snobby about it but the difference is that this game system the mechanics are designed to be automated and so like the intentionality of it is there um and like the rules of the system are ones that lend themselves towards automation rather than being rules that you kind of have to work around to automate round or something like that so sure. um you know without throwing stones I, I think that's like just a little bit of like the difference that i feel in this approach and that like that's intentionally an objective rather than something that's more like bolted on to a system that wasn't designed for that yeah no it's great i'm excited to see how you think of elegant you know uh, automation and you know obviously everybody has their different uh tastes and things like that but i'm i'm super interested in seeing how how you uh how you implemented it yeah and uh we will we will definitely get to that um another thing that's really uh key to emphasize for crucible is that it's designed to be you know it's designed for long form narrative it's designed for but you know it's perfectly suitable for one shot adventures or other types of play um but it is designed for kind of long term character progression long term serial narrative development um, it does not, however, come prepackaged with any sort of like, this is the setting that you have to use. It's intentionally setting agnostic. 
Um, and so it's designed to be coupled with whatever storytelling setting or environment you want to use for your game. So this could be your homebrew world, your, your own creation, your own universe that you want to tell stories in. It could be your favorite IP from, you know, fiction or movies or games. It could be, um, you know, a, a setting that you've grown to love from even other TTRPGs that you want to, you know, keep the setting, but maybe change the rules. Um, and so there's that flexibility in mind. Uh, of course, there are some things that the system, you know, alludes to. It is a fantasy role-playing system. So, you know, we are talking sort of sword and sorcery type mechanics. Um, and then it does, of course, have a fairly unique take on a magic system, which means that whatever setting you pair it with, you'd need to be able to, you know, at least wave your hands enough to, you know, presume that the magic system fits with the setting that you're playing. Um, but aside from that, it is very flexible in that you can kind of bring your own story to the table, and that's that's intentional. So instead of saying, like, these are the ancestries that exist in the world, or these are the backgrounds, or these are the weapon types that exist in the world, Crucible really provides you with the tools to create your own ancestries, or create your own backgrounds, or create your own weapons. Oh, so I that, like that. You know, you as the the GM. Now we provide some out of the box, just so you have like something to start with as examples. They are kind of like basic, and like you'll see, you know, that you can look at like the ancestries compendium pack, for example. Um, you know, we'll provide some so that you have like some examples to work with if you want to just sort of draw from the fairly conventional, you know, fantasy TCRPG playbook. But for the most part, like if you were building a whole new campaign in Crucible. I would expect you might spend, you know, 30 minutes setting up some ancestries for the peoples that live in your world that, you know, that you want to have as options for player characters. And Crucible makes it easy to to create those. Um, Love it. So, yeah, so bring your own story. That's a key. Um, that's a key cornerstone. And just trying to make it really easy to play where you don't have to. You know, we want the rules to be really easy to read. We want the rules to be fun to engage with. Uh, and we want there to be a lot of depth, but we also want for people to just be able to pop in, start making a character, and be ready to play in, you know, 15 minutes. And um, you shouldn't have to have any system knowledge in order to be able to to get through that. And so, you know, trying to balance the, the depth and nuance and complexity with um, ease of use and approachability, that, that's something that we can do or at least try to do hopefully do um you know because we're building this in software and uh that gives us a lot of things that we can you know a lot of tools that we can use this is great okay so i if i'm a new uh gm jumping into this like what's something that you'd like to walk us through from here what do, what do you think is there something else i should click on or should i like import my the play test and or go through a character creation process so this world that you connected to kind of already has the play test imported so um oh i see that's yeah. so that's what i'm looking at here. no okay. need to no need to import it this kind of little like coliseum type arena is like the you know the the pretext for the play test that that you get when you you know that comes with the system right now um mm -hmm. i'd say if you were a new gm you know what i'd really direct you to is under that rules um you know under that rules uh, compendium pack, uh, the second entry under getting started. So for character creation, now we don't, instead of like reading through this, I think what I'd love to do is just go through that with you sort of, I love that. you know, without you having read it, because I want to kind of try and prove that you don't have to have read the rules in order to make your character. Um, okay. But I, I will accept want, your challenge. We also want there to be rules. And so, you know, everything that all of the decisions that you're making are explained in the rules in terms of like, what's this, what's this, how, what's the math, what's the formula, how does it work? Um, but yeah, for a game master that really wants to understand the system, it's all there in the, um, well, all, all that we've made so far is there in the, uh, in the compendium content. Right. Um, and then for players, if you know, you're a, a new player getting started, yeah, maybe the GM will tell you a little bit about what to expect, but really you should be able to just pop in and start, you know, start character building. I love it. Okay, what's what's first in this character creation process? You want me to just go in and create a new character? Yeah, I, think I, I think I gave you, as a player, I think I gave you permission to create your own actor. So you can just make one and you'll make a protagonist, which is what we're calling our player characters. Okay, well, um, my protagonist is going to have my name. So, uh, okay. 
Right. And uh, you'll notice that the character sheet, like the UI style is a little different than the journals. The, some things are still in flux. So we're kind of moving to a new look and feel for the system, but this is sort of still the older style character sheet because some mm -hmm. things are rapidly changing. So this is a, designed to be a little bit more flexible, but we are gonna you know, keep working on the, the UI of the character sheet over time. But yeah, what you'll notice is that uh, you have like a couple of little things that prompt you to do things. So you should hopefully be able to find your way around and just ask me questions as you go. And uh, we'll sort of watch and see how, your, see how your character build goes. Okay, well, clearly I got a big devil kin. So cool, that's what I was hoping. <laughs> um, and then uh, I assume I just drag it to the character sheet, right? That is correct, yeah. Okay, great. And what you'll notice is that your ancestry that you chose establishes a few, uh, some aspect of your starting ability scores, some aspects of your starting resistances. Um, so the and then the background, the background that you choose is going to establish uh, several skills that will start with a rank of training. And you'll also get an initial talent uh, from your background. Okay, great. So, so as I'm dragging those in, it's it's populating things uh, elsewhere, right? Yeah. So all of those things just sort of updated automatically. Like you'll notice, some of your ability scores have increased past one. You have, you know, uh, a resistance and a vulnerability, uh, so you you get the double edged sword with that. Uh, and also, a couple of your skills have a a trained rank in them now. Okay, great. All right. So now, uh, what now? Okay. So what's, what's my next step? Yeah. So we have these little tool tips, uh, that the little orange exclamation marks that sort of tell uh, you, um, you know, what are the things that you still need to do? Ah, uh, okay. So I need to spend things on my, uh, so still like on the attribute. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So as the, yeah, as the tool tip, uh, says you'll spend ability points by uh, increasing your ability scores. So you have a pool right. of nine uh, ability points that you start out with, and you can okay. put those wherever you want. Well, do, what, do I, what do I know about devilkins and urchins? Does it matter? <laughs> well, um, well yeah, be strong. So they, they both have a little bit of overlap in terms of presence, uh, in sort of force of personality and force of, mm -hmm. of will. Um, so, you know, there's options there. Of course, you know, you may want to, before you commit to exactly which uh, ability scores you want to invest in, you, you could already have a character concept in mind. Like you, you might think I want to be, a, you know, a dexterous roguelike assassin, or I want to be a really formidable, you know, intimidating tank paladin or, or whatever. Or you can peruse around the talent tree and get a sense for what options are out there and then decide or, um, you know, Depends on whether you have a, con a character concept in mind. Okay, I want to I want to cast spells because I want to take advantage of all of this uh, JB2A stuff. I assume that's gonna cool. Yeah, my spells cool. So yeah, uh, what am I what am I gonna sh where should I lean into presence and intellect or? So there's sort of three uh, mental aligned attributes of wisdom, presence, and intellect, and there's three physically aligned attributes of strength, toughness, and dexterity. Um, and all three uh, of wisdom, presence, and intellect can allow for spellcasting progression in different ways. Um, and, you know, they Very all have been good here. Yeah. So, you know, you, you might want to choose one or two of those and, and invest in and, uh, you know, and spread your points around however you like. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to be a, a glass cannon here. I'm just going to. So right. helpful. Yeah, and it, it won't let you overspend and it won't let you underspend. Like you you can't finish character creation unless you spend all nine points. So uh there's no there's no ability to to screw it up, which is helpful. That is so nice. Okay, I've I've established my ability points. All right, and then that uh cleared out my attributes. So next up I've got skills. So I need to increase my skill rank. So what are are these skills here? Or my yeah, you'll go to the skills tab. So it's a those are tabs up there. So you'll click. Oh, on Oh, 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 got it, got yeah. it. Okay, those are tabs. Okay, fantastic. Probably some there's there's a little bit of UI UX feedback in that for us. I yeah, think. no, this is good. This is good um, for everybody. Uh, okay, so yeah, now so we've got to figure out. Oh, yeah, we have ahead. sixteen. We have sixteen skills, which are largely for exploration and social um, types of encounters. But all of these skills 
uh, also have uses in combat as well uh, in, in various ways. Um, there's a lot of depth as well as intended depth to the skill system. The first playtest focuses a little bit more on the combat pillar because that's a little bit more closely aligned to the fundamental game balance and dice mechanics and talent progression and, and all of that. But uh, the second playtest or, or possibly third or is going to add some uh, sort of big components for exploration and social um, gameplay that we have been planning and, and we're very excited about. And so skills are useful across the board, but um, uh, you, each skill can be progressed up to five times, and each skill has uh, three specialization paths, which is quite fun. So you'll notice, like, if you click on the cog next to any skill, it will open up a lot of information wow. about that skill. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of depth there. And, and you know, this might not be the, the final UI because we don't want to, like... Ooh, I like that. Oh, no, I love options. Text. But you'll see, you'll see the sort of specialization paths that you can evolve pathfinding into where those are mutually exclusive. So you could become a tracker or an explorer or a cartographer. Um, and you know, as you progress your, your skill, you make that choice at rank three. And, and that is one way among many that your character becomes different than the way that other people build their character. Yeah, that's right. So you can rank up uh, right on the character sheet, or you can do it in this pop-out skill window if you have points remaining. Now. Wow. Oh, got it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's various ways. But that, right there on the sheet, you can kind of up arrow, down arrow to, to invest those skill ranks um, on the sheet. You have to open up the full skill config to choose a specialization path. You can't do that like on the actor sheet. But aside from choosing a specialization path, you can do you can do that on the actor sheet directly. Yeah. So on this sheet here is where I would ultimately be able to choose a specialization. Yes, so once, once I'm unlocks, at the right level, at, mm. unlocked at rank three. So if maybe we'll level up your character in a little bit, so you can see okay. like what that looks like once you you know get progressed enough that you could uh, choose that specialization. Nice. I love the uh, taxonomy and the word choices here, too. Okay. Yeah, we tried to make sure that each of the three specialization paths for every skill is conceptually related, but also distinct. Like, the, striking the right balance between making sure there's a coherent flavor, like they are all varieties of stealth or all varieties of awareness. I really like the awareness one as an example. Um, oh, oh, you've done what? it now. You've I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you just uh, <laughs> ask in the in the talent tree. I love um, it. Okay, so I just let's, let's the just hang out here for the next forty five minutes, please. Right. Uh, okay, wow. great. So, so what is this? I so for this talent, I've already yeah, got. Yeah, so that is what's called a node, and you'll notice if you click on it, mm. it will expand out and mm. have some talent options that are available at that node. So let's go. Uh, the talent tree is. Uh, comprised of many, many nodes. It's a whole web expanding outwards from the origin, and at each talent node, there are multiple choices of talents that you can take. Now, you started with the diversionist talent because of your urchin background. So you have uh, you have a certain action that you can take to distract, um, to cause it, you know, to cause a distraction using your deception skill. Um, and that's useful in combat as well as you know things you can do with it out of combat. Um, and you so you have that as a starting talent, but you also have two additional talent points that you can invest in um, as part anywhere of anywhere on this tree. Then okay, anywhere where you meet the prerequisites. Now you'll oh, notice that each there's six quadrants or, or sextants, I should say, of the talent tree, and each of the each of them corresponds to one of the ability scores. So sort of clockwise from the top, you have quad, uh, sextants for uh, presence, intellect, dexterity, toughness, strength, and wisdom. And so to purchase a talent from a certain node, you do have to meet the prerequisites. You'll notice when you hover over nodes that you don't meet the prerequisite, it will you know, highlight in red why you can't purchase from a certain node. So does that mean I can jump into these already also? These yeah, are unlocked. So that's right. Oh, yeah, so the oh, ones that oh my gosh, this thing gray. goes all the way out here. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. You can Great. see which ones are, are available to you. Um, 
to to make purchases in. Oh gosh! Oh my gosh! This is. And you know, you know I will say weekend. that what's included in yeah. the talent tree is what we call uh, tier one of the talent tree, which covers uh, gameplay uh, for levels about one to eight. Um, there will be three tiers of the talent tree, so this is only this is only a part of a much larger web. And you know, you can imagine, like, if you zoom out, you can sort of see from the graphic the size that it will ultimately be um based on the you know <laughs> oh, the, the sort of larger circle and the lines that are there um okay. it's only it's going out to here right this doesn't it fades yeah. into black uh, that's that's uh upgrade path that later right uh okay so cool so i just need to pick one of these and i'm you guys are gonna have to watch me just agonize over it um yes so i've yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so you may want to to look at for some initial spellcasting talents yeah. is mm -hmm. um, in the intellect and and or wisdom quadrants. Although I think you went more like sort of hybrid presence and intellect. Right. There's a, yeah, that's a good that's a good node for spellcasting because you can choose a, an initial spell rune that gives you a certain uh, spellcasting element. What do you think of death? Is that yeah, gonna be good for demo? You want to be an edge lord? Then yeah, it's a great. I want to be an edge lord. Point. Devilkin okay, Death and then, okay, now so now I've spent all my points, so yes. now I can close it. Okay, here we go. Uh, awesome. Okay, so now now I'm uh, Death Lord. Great. Uh, so now what? Do I go to these other things? Yeah. So now what you do? Yeah, you've you've clicked the button. So basically, we have this kind of gimmick where, like, during character creation, we keep you at like level zero to kind of indicate that you're still in the process of like making your your character and then once you've done all of the steps you were able to click the button that sets you to level one and and that means you have a a game ready character that you are able to you know uh to to roll with um i like it can i ask about the biography would you mind clicking back over to that yeah sure sure um is the public biography and private biography I'm, what i'm thinking is that if you fill out the private the gm can see it and if you fill out the public, it's what the players can see. Yeah. So private biography will be for the game master and for the the players. You know, the player that owns the character, and then public would be you know for like other. If you have at least limited permission to the actor, like other people in your party can see your public biography, or you know, say there's like an NPC that has a public biography. Once as the game master, you give a certain limited level of visibility to that. Uh, character, then players would be able to see that portion of text. So separating it out into two different uh, blocks so that, you know, it's easier awesome. to, to differentiate. Great. Love it. Super helpful. Um, yeah, so you're, you, you're encountering, I guess, the first kind of glimpse of the... Here, I'll give you a... Maybe I'll give you one of Kaora's tokens that he made for the playtest. Yes. I'll give, you the devil, I'll give you the Devilkin hero token that he made. I um, subscribe to Kara's Patreon because this stuff's awesome. Yes, yes. Uh, awesome. He was great. He was excited enough about what I was doing with Crucible. He's like, "I'll make some. I'll make some tokens for your your playtest heroes." So that was really kind of him. Um, so I've just placed your character here onto the um, you know into the arena. Um, so one of the things that you should do as part of character creation, but we don't have a built-in like prompt to kind of nudge you to do it is give yourself a little bit of starting equipment. Um, so over on the inventory tab, there are two compendium packs you can pull stuff from. There's one for weapons and one for armor. Uh, you'll want to give yourself at least a little bit of basic basic adventuring gear. Um, there'll be a lot more yeah. item types available in the system later on, but um, you know, I'm just- I'm going padded basic. armor. Inventory, okay, great. And then I need a weapon, all right. I want to throw fireballs, so I don't really care. Although I did like these. Uh, can I just use any weapon, or do I have to be like... You can use any weapon, yeah. As a spellcaster, uh, there's a category for talismans, which can be a little bit helpful if you want to be more of a pure spell spellcaster, because those can give you the ability to recover oh, focus. Yeah, fetish. yeah I think mm -hmm. so. Call <laughs> fetish, yeah. That matches your edgelord. Uh, I'm in. Yeah, yeah and right. you'll notice that like those items go into your backpack at first, but you can very easily equip them. Um, Great. And now I've got them enabled, right? 
I've got yeah, so the, the skull the skull fetish is currently in your main hand, but if you swapped, yeah, if you equip the claws, then that sort of pops the skull fetish over to your offhand. Ah, um, got it. And you offhand. can customize that, like when you open, if you open like the edit window for a weapon, you can kind of, if a weapon can be equipped in in more than one hand, you can kind of like fine tune exactly what you want that loadout to be. But it's it's pretty smart. It sort of like figures it out for you most, you know, unless you want to do something non-standard. Like there's oh. like a... <laughs> This is where you can create your own weapon and what get, uh, oh, animation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a way for you to attach like your custom weapon to a certain like JB2A animation set. Uh, I love so this. The, I love all these properties too. This is awesome. Yeah, like and and they all have like automation and mechanical impact. So like for example, an ambush weapon, if you're in combat, it costs you an action point to draw a new weapon that you don't already have in your hand, but an ambush weapon can be drawn for free. Uh, you know, so each of these like custom weapon traits has like some mechanical thing about it so that there's, you know, trade-offs between the weapon choices that you, you know, that you have available. Can I, uh, can Joby and Zephyr create characters so I can hit them with a club or yeah, throw a sure. fireball at them? I'm happy to also like pull out a, a low level adversary if you want something that you can. Okay, okay. I'll yeah, I'll take that. That'll give Joby and Zephyr some time sure. to. Uh... Here's a here's a, an angry uh, hyena type uh, creature that's trying to gobble you. Okay, so so let me put you let me put you into a combat encounter real quick. Yeah, let's um, do that so that you can sort of see what that looks like. Um, what you'll notice. On the oh, I had a sorry, I had a combat already active. Let me get rid of that one and then do this guy. Um, so one thing that you'll notice from the combat tracker is that um, it is an initiative-based system. I, I like the concept of initiative. I'm a fan of it, but Crucible has a little bit of a new take on initiative. Um, so each round of combat, you get a new initiative for the round, which keeps things kind of fresh and uh, surprising. Oh, that's um, good. But your initiative is based on the choices that you make in combat. So initiative scales off of uh, intellect and dexterity, which collectively represents oh. your quickness of thought and of uh, bodily action. Um, and then... Uh, you also gain bonuses or penalties to your initiative depending on some other things that you know are on the talent tree or actions that you take. And so you can kind of affect the probability of being earlier in the round or later in the round by the actions that you take. Um, but certainly being earlier is usually uh, advantageous. Um, so if I start combat, we'll see what happens. You did, in fact, win initiative. Um, so one of the things, like I'm a fan of letting players roll, but because initiative re-ups every round. It's currently sort of a background role that just happens. I'm probably going to add an option for that so that, you know, you can give players the option to roll their own initiative for satisfaction's sake. Um, mm -hmm. But for the time being, it just happens sort of each at the top of the round, you get your updated initiative score. Um, so right. what you'll note... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so what you'll notice on your character sheet is that... Uh, on the left hand side, it shows you, you know, what you have equipped, but it also shows you a quick summary of actions that you have available. So let me talk. Oh, you can yeah. just jump right in and try and. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, uh, I just love it. Go ahead. No, no, Slow it's okay. down here. <laughs> um, so uh, what you'll notice is that under the resources section, Crucible has six resources, and resources are kind of what models your effectiveness, uh, your effective state in, in combat. Um, so there's health, which is pretty standard for RPGs. It's your, you know, your bodily well-being at, you know, at any point in time. But there's also wounds. So the way that Crucible handles um, damage, death, dying, risk of death, um, once your health is, reaches zero, uh, you are in an endangered state and you suffer wounds. If your wounds get full, you die. Um, so there's sort of a two there's sort of a two pool system here that um, you know you're in sort of good condition while you're while you have health left, but once you're out of health, you sustain wounds from any damage you take. Once you max out on wounds, you are dead. 
Um, and there's a mirror in the, in the design of uh, a mental resource. So unlike just physical health, we have uh, pools for both sort of physical and mental health as, as twin aspects of adventuring, which I, I think is really fun because it lets you lean into kind of supernatural or magical or, you know, sort of horror themed uh, mechanics, creatures that, you know, are demoralizing or terrifying. Um, and then it also, you know, it's not just player characters that have both health and morale, but all non-player characters also have health and morale. So it gives you multiple paths to winning an encounter. Uh, you can demoralize your foes as a path to victory just as well as you can kill them. Super um, cool. I like that you show me all of what goes into the calculation of all of these too. That's super helpful. Yeah, we've tried to be really good about tool tipping everything so that you don't, you know, forget how things are calculated. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So yeah, there's health and wounds and then morale and madness, and those work the same way as health and wounds. So once you once your morale reaches zero, you enter a broken state where while you're in that broken state, uh, any further morale damage you suffer uh, increases your madness pool. And once madness becomes full, you lose control of your character and it becomes the GM's to do with what they will. Wow. Can I do anything cool in a state of madness? <laughs> uh, there are... A lucky thing for me? <laughs> yeah, uh, there are some things. So normally being at, at zero morale and therefore broken is a bad thing, but uh, there may be some talents that uh, let you kind of you know, get a, a special effect or something when you're yeah. in that state. Um, cool. There's, there's talent. Basically, there's talents that change the way that so many different rules work. So, like a key thing about the talent system is everything I say. Like, oh, you know, X works this way. The idea is that there's probably a talent that sort of changes the rules of that a little bit and makes it work a different way. And so, your choices on the talent tree are ways to really change the way that your character plays. Uh, in a pretty okay. fundamental way. Uh, and then, of course, action and focus. So these define the action economy of the system. Uh, it's a three action point system. So each round in combat, you have three action points to spend however you want. Different actions have different costs. Uh, some actions are free. Some actions are not free. Some actions cost focus. Uh, while your action replenishes every round of combat, your focus does not. Um, so you have to spend your focus wisely over the course of the, the entire combat encounter. Uh, there are some ways to recover focus during combat, but uh, it's a little bit harder to do. It doesn't happen on its own. Wow. Hey, so yes. if I want to hit with my... What am I hitting with? My oh, yeah, main so hand... A strike would oh, be no. your main hand weapon, so this would be your claws. You'd be trying okay. to, to rake at the, the hyena with your equipped claws. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, a well-struck attack, and uh, yeah. you've, you've dealt a, a significant blow there. Um, I'm really me, good at this. Yeah, awesome. Um, I think... Let me check something real quick. I love how yeah, weird so I it is you... that I've spent an action, too. I love yeah, that. Yeah, that's that that cost one action for that one-handed weapon attack. Yeah, that's right. So clear. Um, and one thing that's very cool as the GM is that um, Crucible uses a, a sort of action confirmation system. So it allows the GM a chance to kind of uh, avoid incorrect you know, mistakes or misplays or something. Like if, for example, that was a misclick from a player who was like, oh, I, I clicked the wrong thing. I can, as the GM, just undo it, and it oh. refunds your action point. It restored the the health that you did. Um, oh my goodness! So you can you can kind of reverse any action that happened in case someone was like, wait wait a minute, no no, I, I didn't mean to do that, or you know sometimes you as the GM didn't mean to do that, or you were targeting the wrong creature or something like that. Um, so having that built in, like the two way application, <laughs> reduces a lot of bookkeeping. Um, I want to, sh yeah, you can try uh, distracting or you can try spell casting. I, let me tell I you a little cast bit about, spell. oh, go yeah, ahead. Try, try spell while you do that. Before you cast it, let me tell you a little bit about the spell casting system as well as the dice mechanics for the system. Um, so Crucible uses a 3d8 dice pool as its base resolution mechanic for a check. Um, this has a lot of nice statistical properties uh, in that 
it does a good job of making sure that your probabilities of success of doing a thing have a nice balance between predictability and randomness. It's not entirely random, it's not entirely predictable, but it is more predictable than say just rolling one die, whether it's a 1d20 or a 1d12 or whatever. A 1d anything has a uniform distribution, meaning that like every outcome is equally likely. You're equally likely to roll a one as you are a 20. Um, with a 3d8, it's a normally distributed distribution of outcomes. So you're more likely to roll something in the middle than you are something at the far tails. And that makes that makes uh, checks a little bit maybe more predictable and a little bit less swingy than you might have in like a 1d20 system. Um, but otherwise, a lot of things work still the same way. You'll notice your 3d8, however, get modified whenever you add banes or boons. So boons and banes are situational advantages or disadvantages that represent the fact that you are, you know, in a good circumstance or a bad circumstance with the check that you're trying to do. Those can be things that are just improvised on the fly by the DM. It could be like, you did such a great job role playing how you were going to make that attack. I'm going to give you a boon on your attack roll. Or it can be things that are mechanically rules of the system, like the the target has the exposed condition and when it's exposed your melee attacks against it all get two boons um and those things are fully automated so there's things like when status effects or conditions that the target has give you boons or banes to your attack those are just automatically applied really would i see it here reflected in this uh, yeah you would so for example if you close that window and i'll put i'll just put the exposed condition on the on this creature. Now, there's normally like actions that, you know, someone would take to put that condition on the creature. But if you go to like your strike attack now, um, you would notice that, oh, maybe not. Maybe at the moment, okay, yeah, yeah. This is something that's still under development. If you roll your strike attack, it will add it. It's just, there is still a to-do that uh, it needs to show up in that, in that window. So yeah, expand out the chat card for the attack you just made and you'll notice that like your first die was a d12 from those two boons uh, yep. the exposed condition sure it's, enough. it's just a ui thing i need to make sure that those show up in the in the initial card but there's lots of things like that that still like you know construction well, zone work in progress but uh i like it and i like that i get to see what exactly how it rolled perfect yeah and uh, yeah the chat cards are very informative so when you expand it out you'll see that like you had a certain dice the total on your dice pool, you had a certain bonus from your ability scores, you might have a skill bonus or an enchantment bonus under certain circumstances. Okay, yeah. And then one of the things that you'll notice is that like damage is there's not a separate damage roll. This is something that is really interesting in Crucible that makes combat fast paced. It makes it, you know, uh, I, I think really exciting. Uh, you are rewarded for rolling better on your attack roll. Better attack rolls mean more damage. A less good attack roll means less damage or possibly no damage. Um, so you know all of your all of your marbles are in that in that basket of you know your three d eight dice pool. Interesting. If you, get, if you get boons to your dice, if you get boons to your uh, attack roll, that means you're going to deal more damage if you hit. So like there's a direct mapping there that it's not like oh I rolled a I rolled a thirty one to hit, but I, that's just seven points of damage. Yep. Um, got it. Interesting. And so the way that damage works is if you expand out the chat card, there's a um, an overflow, which is what you rolled in excess of the defense threshold. And then on top of overflow is added a base damage for your weapon or a base damage for your spell. Um, there may so was be the some... defense threshold of 15 and I rolled a 20? Is that what yes, this ultimately right. calculates yeah, so to? You... Okay. Yeah, so the, the physical defense of this hyena is a 15. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so I beat it by five. So I get an extra five damage on top of my base damage. Yeah. Right? And so if you had rolled a 22, you would have dealt 11 damage. If you roll Got a 23, it. you'd deal 12 damage. Yeah. Um, so that's the way the, the damage, uh, Love the damage that. component works. That's great. Wow. And then you also automatically do damage resistance. I saw that things come with resistances. Yeah. So resistances and vulnerabilities, those are all automatically incorporated in any damage that's dealt. Uh, resistances and vulnerabilities are additive. So like on your character, if someone hit you with radiant damage, you would take five more damage than, uh, than what the base, you know, the base amount of damage was. So vulnerabilities are a, a danger. 
Um, but I think they lead to tactical gameplay that gives everyone strengths and weaknesses. And creatures in the Crucible system almost always have some resistances and some vulnerabilities. So like, there's always the incentive to try and like know your foe and know your adversary and, and try and you know, exploit their vulnerabilities and avoid their resistances. Uh, also with their different defense scores. So like there's, there's different defense types that you might target with an attack. Um, and some creatures are, you know, good at defending in, in various ways. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's some like knowledge is power element there in terms of, you know, knowing how to, how to best counter a particular foe. Uh, try the spell casting. So you're you're out of you're almost out of combat uh, out of action here in this round of combat. So you might have to hold your spell for next round. So fair enough. You have one action left. Uh, let me show you. So you moved. Let me show you actually how move works uh, okay. formally. I'm going to put you back in in here. You'll notice that you have a move action, and you'll also notice that that move action is free. Um, so everyone gets a free move action once per round. Unless, asterisk, certain things are true, um, which makes it easy. Like you, you can, you can always feel like you can move around without having to give up your action economy. Um, so you can either use the move action directly off the sheet, or you'll notice if you use the uh, ruler, like if you do like a control, you know, control drag to measure uh, distance. You'll notice that the action cost of uh, movement is directly oh, built into whoops. the ruler, um, and you'll see nice. like how the action cost of movement increments as you move different amounts. So if you like hit spacebar to actually like do the move, three AP, right? It will it will automatically like consume your action, and you see that that showed up in chat. That consumed your uh, your action from you know from that uh, from that move. That was just your cool. free move that you did. Yes. Um, cool. Oh, did you want so me to use my action so that you can uh, try to attack? You can either me? use it or tough. you can save it. If you save it, you will end up with a boon to your initiative next round. Oh, all right. Let's do um, that. All right. So let's see how this, you know, this hyena, what the hyena makes of you. So, for example, the hyena would use its free move action to get to you, and then it's going to try and, you know, it's going to try and chomp at you. Uh, yeah, you take some, you take some Ooh. piercing, you take a lot, Ooh. this, see, you were the Ooh. one who made a glass cannon here. Uh, yes, Bailey, I did, you? I sure did. You're the one who... I am oh, eating my words. Out. Look at that, you you're already down. killed me. That's how it's you know it's taking you out. I'll give you, as a, as, as a consolation prize, I'll give you one hit point left so that you'll get a, get a turn next turn. Maybe. Oh, yeah, I'm Jim. Potentially. Now, here's the thing, you're not guaranteed that you're going to go before this hyena next round. That's oh, so cool. Right. Okay. So let's see if you. Cut row. Back. Yeah. No. You. You did yeah. have a boon to your initiative, but you rolled an eight. So uh, you rolled a nine. So I think this thing is probably going to uh, going to to be able to dispatch you. Um, imagining that it didn't, I want to show you how spellcasting works. You'll notice that you get your action points back at the start of your turn. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Go ahead and try uh, spellcasting. And okay. I want to. You... I want to. Okay. Let's see what I can do here. I will what? caution you. That and you would you would know this probably if you had a moment to uh, read your grimoire, but the the gestures that you know and I'll, I'll I'll explain what that means in a moment. You only at the moment know touch based gestures, so Ooh, you at okay. the moment have only unlocked the ability to cast spells by oh, okay. touching something. So um, I want to. So you would have to remain to in melee range if you want to if okay. you want to do that. So um, I've got you targeted, and if I go to cast spell, uh, those boons I had, I don't have them anymore, or do I? Well, I removed the exposed condition uh, uh, from the target okay. because it doesn't actually have that. I was, you know, sort of Fair highlighting enough. it a little bit. but uh, Okay, so I have, this is my spell, Deathly Influence. Yeah, so let's talk about spells. Spells are composed in the system uh, in a kind of dynamic, dynamic way. So instead of a list of spells like this is the spell, you either know it or you don't, you can cast it or you can't, in Crucible the way that spellcasting works is you learn the components of spells and then using the components of spells that you know you can cast anything that you can make with those components. So the components of spellcasting are runes, 
which describe the essence of spellcraft that you're that you're creating. So it could be sort of like elemental or conceptual, the type of magic. Uh, a gesture is a physical uh, manifestation of how you produce the magic. Now you know the touch gesture, which is just a very basic one that everyone starts with, or you know the influence gesture, which is kind of a supercharged, powered up version of touch. Um, so you learned the influence gesture through the talent tree, which is basically like a, a, a an extra good uh, touch attack. Mm. Um, there's also inflections, which are vocalized permutations or alterations of a spell that can make the spell behave differently in some fundamental way. So deathly influence is the spell that you would get if you combine the death rune with the influence gesture. If you were to apply an inflection on top of that, it would maybe become something different. Cool. Wow. So can I cast it? Yeah, go go for it. I hope you roll well. Me too. Mm, you have not rolled well. Mm. Unfortunately, on, you have man. not exceeded its fortitude. But you do have an action remaining. Uh, and the touch gesture, which is a, a more lightweight uh, attack in that it only well, I would have to pick one it. AP instead of two, okay. you could get a second spell in in hopes to finish the job. That has, in fact, succeeded. You deal nine corruption damage. That's um, what I'm talking about. And right. you have dispatched the hyena. Awesome. awesome. Now, I, I think you wanted the, the payout of getting some awesome like JB2A animations. I yeah. expected one to happen there, but I think maybe touch-based corruption magic. I haven't linked that up yet. Let me show you an example of like a. Let me show you an example of some spells that. Actually, it might just be touch in general that I haven't, haven't fully. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. Basically, <laughs> the process of making sure every spell has an associated animation is like a little bit of ongoing work in progress. But so you've you've defeated we'll we'll get an example to show you of that uh, pretty soon. You've defeated the the hyena. So imagine mm -hmm. that upon victory you um level up. So I'm going to I want to see you build out this character a little bit more. Uh cuz I want to see where you go with it and I want to show you how some higher level stuff works. Okay. So I need to know what to do next. Um... Go ahead just for just for a demonstration up at your level where it says level one, why don't you set your level to like five or six? Okay. Just, just go, just go straight for it. All um, right. Cause yes. I want, I want you to show you how some things work on the talent tree when you have a little bit more talents to spend. Okay. Should I just jump straight over the talent tree? Yeah. Why don't you do that? Because looking at the talent tree might make you decide where you want to put your mm -hmm. ability points okay. that you have access to. Okay. One of the things well, I want to draw your attention to is what are called signature nodes. Um, so at the outer perimeter of tier one, there are nodes that are hexagonal in shape. The outer, the outer perimeter. Oh, like so out here? Yeah, out there. That's oh, right. Yeah, hexagonal yeah. shape. Yep. So those are what's called signature nodes. And each signature node contains talent options that fairly fundamentally alter the way that your character plays. Now, all talents contain things that are rule altering in some way or give you action options. But the signature nodes are a little bit more transformative in terms of really defining the type of character that you are. So, so if I example, want to build towards a spell blade, I would want to be building in strength and intellect. So yeah, if you wanted to build towards spell blade. And, and that, in, in a sense, would be a pretty good fit for you because you already have points in both strength and intellect. You're, you're kind of on the path to something like that, All you, though you do not have to build a spell blade. Um, but the way that Spellblade works, for example, is you get the ability to interweave spells with your weapon attacks really easily. You're better at that than anyone else. You're able to cast a strike gesture with your weapon um, at reduced cost every round. And so, like, that kind of, like, Gish-style, um, you know, sword and sorcery combined character build like this signature talent enables a certain play style where if you want that to be your thing, you can be better at that thing than anyone else by taking that particular signature talent. If you wanted to be like a more conventional sort of spell slinger, you might look at a talent like War Mage or Conjurer, which are things that are, you know, 
conceptually sort of I, I want to be like the you know the best the best battle mage I can be type of thing. Okay, great. All right, so where do you suggest I go from here if we want to see some eye candy? <laughs> uh well, uh, do you want to do you want to go more like the battle mage type route, like ranged spellcaster, or do you want to sure. go for some sort of hybrid role? Oh, uh, okay. Let's go hybrid role. That sounds fun. Okay. Uh, so you might want to look into if you want to be like hybrid spell melee, like what I mentioned. You know, you are looking at spellblade. That's a good choice for that. There's also, uh, you know. Tactician or Justicar, uh, Operator, Fulcrum. These are all ones you already have a lot of presence. If you want to be a little bit more tanky, you could go for like Dreadlord. That's more of like a defensive kind of intimidation style tank. There's just really like so many options. Yeah. Um, you just tell me what to click on because I could spend all night here and, uh, and all day tomorrow and still. All right. Well, why don't you build towards, towards War Mage since that sort of spellcaster okay. build was your initial inclination? So, War Mage is a signature at the boundary between presence and intellect. So, that's like one o'clock. Um, okay. Like over here? Uh, one up, up a little bit more at the boundary between. Yeah, there you go. Got it. And so to get War Mage, you're going to mm -hmm. need a five in both intellect and presence. So you might mm -hmm. want to go back to your uh, character sheet. Oh, I see. Okay. And, you know, you've got some attribute points to spend. So every time you oh, level up, yeah, you okay. get, every time you level up, you get one point okay. that you can increase okay. your ability scores. You get two skill points and you get two talent points. Uh, okay. Every time gonna... you level up, you get lots of choices you can make. No, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait four levels to get something cool. You get cool stuff every level. Um, Sweet. Okay. So now I've got enough to to build towards War Mage. I got more than enough, right? I could have really built up other stats, but could, I really want to diversify. You know, you're you're. I see you're committed to the toughness one. You know, you'll you'll live and die on this mountain. Uh, that's, right. that's That's good. I, I appreciate okay. that. You'll either okay. you'll either win gloriously or you'll you'll die very quickly. I mean, it, it's a uh, just send out one more hyena. It's yeah, way it's be a show. yeah. So to to unlock War Mage, you do have to like kind of purchase to your there. way to it. You're gonna need yeah. to buy a talent that connects to that node. Okay. Uh, sorry. So I need to be like maybe up here. Does, what does this get? Yeah, Anything? Either of those. You can sort of see if you zoom in. You'll see that there's lines that show you like what connects. So okay. you just need to purchase a talent that would eventually like lead to War Mage. Okay. Void collar. That sounds. It's like a yeah. shot collar. Yep. Oh, let's go. Nice. All right. Yes, yes. I'd also definitely suggest over in the intellect quadrant, you should purchase maybe the arrow gesture, uh, which is How one of best these? to describe this. From the intellect node that you have already where you purchased the death rune, it's up and to the right. So the cyan blue, the light blue, the oh. one you already purchased by the origin. Oh, by the origin down right here. Off, yeah, right off the origin, the other one. The other one. That oh, the other one. Okay, got yeah. it, got it. Okay. That's where you one got the these. death rune. If you keep going out from there, like up and to the right, oh, you see. might want to get like the... Why don't you get both of those gestures? Because that's one like single target range damage, and then like you get some AoE as well. And this one? Yeah. Okay. Six also, points left. Also, why don't you grab a different elemental type maybe so that i can show you how some different runes work so in that same node where you purchased the death rune okay that's uh this one yeah you could you could maybe take either lightning or fire depending on which speaks to you more i get i still want to launch a fireball really cool at these guys show but... is extending out from the the place where you bought the arrow gesture up and to the right again yep up up one more oh. Well, actually, that one's a good choice, too. There's good stuff all there. Uh, yeah, like, take a look and see what catches your eye. That, like, if you like doing, you know, death damage or you like doing lightning damage, there's things that can make those better. Um, I think stick with fire. Yeah. Okay. There's cool stuff all over. One thing I'd like to draw your attention to... Well, no, nah, it's okay. Yeah, it's all right. There's just like you could, as you said, you could kind of amuse yourself for for hours, kind of looking through this. Impetus is great, gives you bonus to initiative. Uh, you get if you if you win initiative for the round, uh, on the first round of combat, if you were the first 
actor on the first round of combat, you get an extra action point. So you get four AP instead of instead of three. Pretty powerful. I really like how the progression of magic is. I don't know how to really explain it, but it it seems to have like the explanations for how those things are cast built in. And so I always find that like sometimes I'm overwhelmed by the role playing of how to explain how I'm casting a spell. And I just mm -hmm. like that baked into it, into the choice is like, well, it's going to be touch. I'm going to use my voice um, as opposed to having like VSM, you know, sort of buried somewhere deep in to the description. That's super cool. Yeah. And it also means that like, you know, there are certain talents that like there's a talent that can allow you to use certain inflections without needing to vocalize, like you can do them silently. There's, you know, aspects of gameplay, like if your hands are, you know, if your hands are bound, you're not going to be able to perform a gesture. But maybe there's a talent that lets you do certain gestures, even if you don't have, you know, use of your hands or talents that, you know, there, there's always like for every problem that that gameplay can can present to you, there's sort of a, a talent that can solve that problem. That that's the cool. way that we can build the talent tree to like give creative solutions to problems that make your character feel unique. Like for example, there's one like Iromancer. Like if you become enraged, a downside of the enraged condition is that you can't spend focus. But if you have the Iromancer talent, you can spend focus while you're enraged. And so, you know, like you can be like an anger wizard. Um, and, you know, that that <laughs> helps like define your character persona yeah. in a way. Like if that's a talent you take that, you know, sort of can can, you know, help define the way that you role play the character a little bit as well. Awesome. OK, so here's all, all of my runes, plus all the other things I, I added. So as I was picking that skill tree, it was adding. Uh, it was adding these things to my. My grimoire. Yes, that's right. Cool. Yeah, so you have you have more options now um, in terms of like which rune and which gesture you can use. Um, so, so I'll, I can uh, here we go. So I can say I want to do flame, and then yeah, let me give you a let me sure. give you a target to to grapple with. Um, All right, I'll give you a pair of a pair of hobgoblins that are gonna try yes. and try and take you down. Um, Let's move them back a little bit, and I'll put you into a combat encounter. Okay, so we'll see if you can survive with your toughness one. Um, as uh -oh. this this hobgoblin's <laughs> going to try a precision shot against you. Ah, oh, you dodge. Okay, so this is a good example of. Hey, nice. Yeah, you see the the arrow that like misses, and it 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 supports both hits and misses. Uh, all credit to you know sequencer and JB two A yep. on that, but. Um, you know, that that's integrated in terms of like, did it hit or did it miss? The animation is consistent with that. Um, so when a, an attack misses you for your physical defense, if you look on your character sheet, you'll notice that uh, there's different categories of that physical defense. So there's armor, dodge, parry, and block. Um, and so you don't have any parry or block, but you do have some armor and uh, and a bit more dodge. So when an attack misses you due to your physical defense, the manner in which it misses is determined based on the composition of those defense categories. So it tells you, like, did you dodge it, or did did your armor protect you, or did you block it, or did you parry it? Um, cool. And so you get to wow. know, like, how did you defend against the attack? And how you defended against the attack gives you opportunities to do different things. So there's talents like... When you parry an attack, you can take a reaction to counterattack. And so, you know, the manner of your physical defense opens up opportunities for, for gameplay um, that, you know, riff off of different talents or different actions that you might have. Yes. Uh, okay, this, I want to take my turn and kill this guy. You get to go next. He has one action left. He's going he's gonna to take the defend action to make himself harder, to, uh, harder to kill. But it is now your turn. Yes. All right. So I can sh uh, kill it at uh, distance now, right? Yeah, so you have the arrow gesture, which is a single target ranged uh, attack, or you have the fan gesture, which is a... It's short range, but it is AoE. If you wanted to try and hit both of them, you could maybe do that. But arrow is a sort of... Uh, arrow is a single target ranged attack. 
Uh, let's see. How do I how do I target both of them with my fan? Does it place yeah, a template? So, uh, what you'll see is when you have the spell craft dialogue up for fan, there's a button on it to place a template, which will prompt you to use it. It's up at the top. Um, it'll prompt you ah. to. Uh, and so, yeah, fan is not like a large AOE. It's more of like a cleave. So, you know, maybe not useful in this situation, but it does give you some tactical flexibility. If there's like two or three targets next to each other, you can kind of like get all three of them with a spell. So it's not going to hit anything, but I can potentially see an animation here. Is that right? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd use the arrow gesture if you're looking for flashy oh, effects well, personally. All right, I got to redo that. Let's see. Kind of spell, flame, arrow, target. I'm going to target this guy because he's not. Oh, I got them both. All right, let's try this. Ah, critical hit. So this is perfect. Of course it was. Um, it'll, I think, did you take the Pyromancer talent? I think maybe you did. Yeah, yeah you did. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this is a good, a good opportunity to demo how that works. So the way that critical hits work is, of course, critical hits always deal more damage because the higher you roll on your attack roll, the more damage you do. That's kind of just the way that the scaling works, but it's not like double damage or anything like that. Critical hits all open the opportunity for critical effects. So in your case, because you took the Pyromancer talent, you have a critical effect that when you crit with fire damage, you set your target on fire. Um, uh. So when I'm going to approve this, I'm going to confirm this spell, and we'll see the nice animation, hopefully. Yep, there we go. Yes. Uh, you you wow. hit your target, you set your target on fire. You notice that the target now has an effect. Yep. Um, and that burning effect that you did is going to apply at the start of its turn, which happens to be next, and it's going to take additional fire damage because you set it on fire. Amazing. Awesome. You have an action left. I know. I want to. I want to like move. Uh, let's see. Hold control. Right. Going to gain some, gain some distance. That's a good. That's right. Good call. Um, yeah. So as it becomes uh, this guy's turn, uh, I thought that that was going to happen automatically at the beginning of his turn. Did it not? Might be a bug that needs investigation. I expected that fire damage to tick, and I don't think it did. But, you know, hashtag work in progress. He does right. have the burning condition, so I can see that the effect applied correctly, mm -hmm. but I don't think the damage did. Um, yeah. yeah, so he might say, like, oh, I've got a you know, spend an AP to get over to, you know, to you, and then this I don't think I have this hobgoblin kitted out with any talents, but he's going to try and take you down with a couple of weapon strikes. Again, so you dodge it. You see that it misses that you. One you toughness. Know that Love you that. You manage to sidestep, and you dodge again as, as you're one tough nut. like a madman. Uh, and you win initiative in the second round, so Amazing. Uh, you, get to go, you get to go first in this round. That was this your... is so cool. I'm really what looking forward this to this now. Doing Arrow it. of Flame. Like, Why do I have these... Uh extra kind of available actions here. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is something I'm workshopping, but basically it remembers whatever the last spell you cast was. Okay. And it yeah. keeps it in your list in case you want to like do the same thing again. Okay. So I want to like move. Jump off the cliff. Oh, that's not what that was. Okay. Yes. You're now falling to your death, but it's it's very that's glorious. okay. Um, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna kill this guy on my way down. All right. <laughs> cool. I love it. Um, before we, I, I know we could just like keep play playing around for a long time. I, I, I don't want to drag this on, but I do want to show you some cool things quickly with um, the way that you know some things like positioning and movement work. So I know. Yeah, let's show, like, let's do one more thing, and then um, you know we'll kind of leave it there, and uh, let people come in and play with it. Yeah, sounds good. This one will be pretty quick. Um, Suppose you have some allies here. I noticed that uh, Zephyr rolled up a little character. Joby rolled up a little character. And then suppose there's a couple of uh, more hobgoblins. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is automation for things like um, engagement and flanking is all automated as well. So like as these hobgoblins sort of move into combat, you'll notice that like Zephyr is oh, like gaining cool. a flanked condition. And as like more hobgoblins pile in, his flanking condition is like getting worse 
and now oh, wow. uh you know now wow. you're also flanked and so all of that like positional things and, and flanking like gives you you know if you have allies that are supporting you and flanking a target you get additional boons to your attack all of that's automated so as you're moving around tactically in combat you're thinking about like how do i want to use my movement how do i want to reposition so that i give myself the best possible advantages that i can have to kind of like oh, maximize look at that. my yep my success Seeing my active effects and that's cool yeah and if you were to like take a step back that condition just goes, goes away as you were like no longer flanked cool awesome uh, so that was just a quick one but you know just other examples of the types of things that are just like handled um you know handled by the system there's a lot more that uh could be said but you know hopefully this has been fun for people to see and hopefully it's enticing to folks to get them to want to, you know, check it out. Um, as I mentioned, the system is like currently uh, in a, a sort of limited private playtest for our Patreon supporters, but it will be eventually uh, available to everybody for free. It's not going to be premium. You don't have to buy it. Everyone is going to get this game system for free if you own Foundry VTT. That's amazing. Well, as a longtime Foundry Patreon supporter, I am super excited to play with this. Me too. Hey, Atropos, Andrew, thank you for walking us through this. This is awesome. I feel like this is all I'm going to do this weekend. Uh, what a what an interesting um, system that's built into Foundry and uses all the cool stuff that you've got. Um, guys, any any other questions for Andrew? No, I'm super pumped to try this out myself. Awesome. Yeah, this that's is that's, great. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a we have a. a a channel in our Discord server, well, not just a channel, it's actually a section, like, there's a couple channels, um, and it's not just for people who are, like, have access to the playtest, anyone can can join the discussion there. If if you or anyone else has, has questions, drop by the, you know, the Crucible category in our Discord server, and, you know, drop your questions in. I'm always, like, looking for feedback and ideas and, uh, you know, questions that people have. And, you know, please bear in mind that this is still like an alpha, you know, early on uh, thing. There's like a lot more that we're going to do that we need to do. Um, it's a very ambitious thing that's going to take, you know, quite some time to to really like be be finished. But um, it's in a state that's already like in a good place for, you know, doing some play testing and, and checking it out and giving that feedback. And so uh, if this is something that looks exciting to you, please do check it out and uh, let us know what you think. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for making uh, a great VTT and for making this new game system. And uh, yeah, let us know in the comments how you guys get along with it and what ideas that you might have, um, and you know, questions that you've got for Andrew. And we'll we'll try to uh, get those answered. And in the meantime, uh, thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.